Welcome to Redress Class. Um, it's December 30th of 2019, and um, I just wanted to do a quick phone call. Um, my original intention was to get together on the phone with everyone who called in to the Sydney Copley, to Sydney Copley in the governor's office and to give a meeting report and an update, and then to share our ideas on what <clears throat> we need to do in regards to OCS. Um, today, I sent out her first response since the initial meeting that we had. I forwarded it to everyone. And um, that had a link, like I was telling Chris, that had a link to the 2017 State of Alaska Ombudsman's report. And I asked everybody to please read the last few pages of the report because it's the bullet points that Tammy sent in um, and her concerns about OCS and what you'll, what you'll realize if you read those last few pages is that the state already knows the problem. They were informed. Tammy told them. And these are things that um, basically she's saying they're, they're avoiding the law. They're doing all the things that we know they're doing, but she told them uh, in 2017, she told them that it was a certainty based on 50 case files she reviewed. She had also given the testimony. She had gone to the ombudsman. She had gone to the grand jury. She really did her due diligence, So, um, and they've known for long enough. Um, but the reason we went to this meeting with Sidney Copley in the first place, and we can talk about this. I'm happy to go through that meeting and the call. I had a call from Dave Donnelly, the Vice Commissioner of Administration, before the meeting happened. If anybody cares to discuss the details of those things, we can do that during question and answers in a few minutes. But what I'm saying here the reason I supplied that report to everyone who's an advocate around the state, um, the bottom line is we need to come up to speed quickly on redress and remonstrance claims. Uh, we need to know how to do this because um, we have exhausted the re administrative remedy. Um, we don't. We want to go through it quickly so we can come up to speed without hanging around, wasting even more time. Um, now, the reason I went to the administration in the first place was that I talked to Tammy about petitions of redress and remonstrance. And the fact that it's covered in the Mason's Manual, the fact that there's this is happening in the other states, um, and I sent out links to all of those people that are doing this. That's, that's in the initial email talking about this, this class. I put down Chris Hallett and how to find his stuff, and Kirk Pendergrass, and David Strait, and John Gentry. Um, Gus Breton's got a Redress for Dummies site that he's had for years before he ever met these folks. And so it. I talked to Tammy about this redress and remonstrance idea, the fact that it's in the Mason's Manual, but I never did talk to her, and I haven't yet talked to the governor's office about how this is loss prevention. And by the time we're finished tonight, you'll understand why the state should be highly motivated to do, to hear these petitions for redress and remonstrance. Everybody in the House and Senate should be highly motivated based on stop loss, based on loss prevention, to hear these petitions of redress and remonstrance. So it's going to help the state. Uh, it's going to help the legislature. It's going to help every branch of government. Um, and you'll understand why <clears throat> at the end um, as we put all these things together. My perspective is that people are being tortured, kids, parents, families. They're being t tortured in myriad ways. They're being trafficked for all kinds of egregious, hor just hor horrible things, but it amounts to tort crime. Tort crime calls for a remedy. Um, <clears throat> so, and who's doing the tort? These are criminal acts of those in positions of public trust. So 
they're either acting directly under an oath of office or acting under the auspices of those in an office bound by oath, or they're acting under a corporate charter, which again, no matter who they are, they are under an oath of office to uphold our law. And we know that we have remedy available if we know our rights and if we can stand up on them. So that's why I asked everyone, um, it was in the email, you might not have seen this, but I asked you to bring a copy of your rights. And that would mean, you know, you bring your rights with you wherever you go, but the bills of rights, uh, the, the bills of rights, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution for the United States of America, and the Alaska bills of rights. And I also ask you to bring a notepad and pen so that as we go through, anything that you're not sure about that you need clarification on, make sure you jot yourself a note so that you can ask questions later. And then if you're listening to this, most people are going to be listening to this at a time that's convenient for them. We're going to have this recorded. We're going to have it um, in video form so you can go through and in a half an hour kind of come up to speed on what this redress and remonstrance is. And so if you're listening to it later, jot down your questions and call me, send me an email, whatever. And then the other thing too, we're going to do this class tonight going to go through it quickly. We're going to take time for questions and, and, and answers, but I want to continue to repeat and continue to do the class over and over again. Anytime somebody needs the class, we'll do it over again, or we'll send them the, the link so they can hear it. But we'll always be available. Those of us who kind of come up to speed on the process will always be available for a phone call to talk to somebody who's trying to come up to speed on the process. And so my the, the reason I do these, want to do these calls often, the, our Free the People call, is so that I don't spend my valuable time during the week doing 15 phone calls. I want to do one phone call and talk to everybody at the same time. I want us all to be kind of singing from the same sheet of music. I want us all to be on the same page. So that's the importance of these conference calls. But if you miss some of it tonight, there will be time for you to catch up. We need to know the bills of rights backwards and frontwards in order to uphold them for ourselves and for our fellow man. And I need to make a correction on this where we talk about standing up for our fellow man and when we talk about being an advocate, uh, say you have an official title and you're in the Office of Public Advocacy, it all basically comes from the same, the same idea that we get to stand up for our own rights, but it's our duty. Well, it's our duty to stand up for our own right, and it's our duty to stand up for our fellow man. So, I talked about um, a couple weeks ago. I heard myself uh, as I was doing a video. Heard myself that say that taking standing under a beneficial public interest is kind of the same as being in a class action lawsuit. And I just want to correct that. Class action lawsuit is all those similarly positioned. They're all going through the same thing. But when I take standing under a beneficial public interest to uphold your rights when I see your, your rights being violated, that's just me saying, for the good of all of us, we're, we're all going to stand up for each other. And so I think that's really pertinent to the way um, advocates for people going through situations with, with Office of Children's Services or any of the welfare services or any time we're aware that somebody else's rights are being trampled, that's really pertinent to this topic. Um, so before we start also, and this is, this is all by way of introduction, um, <clears throat> just things to keep in mind. Um, and this is a caution. Raise only the arguments that support your conclusion and leave all the others to those who are your adversaries. 
So what we're doing tonight is, is figuring out our standing based on what we have and, and the facts of what's going on in law. Um, I've sent out a couple emails talking about this class, and I, I'd like everybody to go through and find the proclamation establishing Task Force Alaska and just read through that. Um, and I think you'll get a great understanding of what this task force is here to do once you've had gone through this class. So if you j just read the proclamation. And then the other thing to understand is that a Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure is the basis of what the Alaska legislature uses when its unified rules are created. So the unified rules, if you look up on Alaska, the Alaska legislative website, you'll find the unified rules. And those are based on the, um, Mason's, the 2010 Mason's Manual of Legislative Procedure. In 2020 now, there is a revision for 2020, and I don't have the answer to this question. If somebody could call the chief clerk's office and find out if they're switching over to the 2020 manual, that would be good information to have. Within this manual are 10 rules of group decision making. And it governs how the legislature makes decisions. So that's one thing that Chris Hallett goes over all the time is the 10 rules of decision making. Anytime the legislature is in session and they're not following these rules, those are just general rules that they can be called out upon. So <clears throat> we start we start here, we start the class here at the First Amendment. And um, we've gone over this lots of times in on our Free the People show. Maybe what I'll do right now is just before I start it, let's um, let me give everybody a chance to chime in because I didn't hear from many people that they were here. And then um, I, I want to start with oath of office and uh, and the the First Amendment. So if you could let us know you're here. Wendell's here. Hi, Wendell. Hello, Maria. Welcome. OK, and then also, um, if anybody else wants to chime in, speak now. All right. We're just gonna we're just gonna go then. Um, we don't want this to take very much time. We want everybody to be able to come up to speed quickly. So everybody knows that there's there's a Bill of Rights. We just celebrated Bill of Rights Bills of Rights Day. Um, that is uh, around December fifteenth of the year. And there's a proclamation that Donald Trump put out uh, in twenty seventeen that said, hey. We, we need these things. We need these bills of rights and declaration on human rights. And so we, I always point out, this is American jurisprudence. 16 American jurisprudence at, at uh, 100 talks about bills of rights. That would be the Federal Bill of Rights that we're all familiar with, the first 10 articles and amendment to the Constitution of, for the United States. Um, and then your state. Constitution, Declaration of Rights, which very often sound like a, a, you know, they recited the Bill of Rights again in the state constitutions, but made some changes. So the Bills of Rights are declare our common law, and I'm reading from a footnote by Sir John Fortescue, and uh, Fortescue was a. a a well-known common lawyer in England. And he's talking about um, our law. Our law requires elected officials, appointed magistrates, and military men to swear an oath of loyalty to a set of common law first principles called the Constitution, and never to political leaders. Common law government is a government of laws and not a government of men. And this is reading from uh, chapter one of 
Brent Winter's book, Excellence of the Common Law. That's on page 44. And over on page 45, um, something I didn't understand, but the words, it says, uh, footnote 60, the words due process of law were without doubt intended to convey the same meaning as the words by the law of the land in Magna Carta. And it gives all the references. So when we hear due process, we think the law of the land, the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, the bills of rights are our common law, and the elective officials, before they can take office, they, a man raises his right hand, man or woman, man, the general, uh, raises his right hand and swears an oath uh, of loyalty to a set of common law first principles called the Bills of Rights. So they agree that they're going to uphold our law and that's the law of the people that created them. And that's where the oath comes in. So the, when, when that public official raises his hand and swears the oath, that is an unconditional, irrevocable oath of office. And if you think of it as in this commercial realm where the corporations that our states reside, that is, um, if you think of it in terms of a, a contract, that's an offer. They've made an unconditional, irrevocable offer to you. And many people that I know are now accepting the oaths of office of, of all the officers they come in contact with so that they have a private binding contract with that representative. And it just, it, you know, it, it really is redundant. It really doesn't shouldn't need to be done. They've taken this oath of office, but for some reason, and what's the reason, why are they not upholding this oath of office? The First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion, prohibiting the free exercise thereof, abridging the freedom of speech or the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. So that's what we're here to talk about tonight. There's no way out. There is no way there's any public official that can make a rule or a law that, that denies us our right to petition the government for redress, to assemble and petition the government for redress. So we're going to talk about how do you do that. Now, um, what you have to understand is courts of justice versus the courts of law. The courts of law are the things that we know as courts. Lawyers, lawsuits, you know, downtown, the court building. Courts of justice, you find those in the legislature. The courts of justice are there to listen to our redress and our remonstrance by the people. Okay, so if you, if you understand that common law is the law that pertains to the people who created the government and that the highest office that you can hold, the highest office in the land is that of man or woman, to be one of the, the men or women of the land. Okay, so we have... Um, We're, we're in the highest office. We have public servants to uphold our, our law, and we have the First Amendment to tell us we have the right to assemble the government and petition it for the redress of grievances. So the House of Representatives has the sole power of impeachment. Okay? Now, we talked about, I talked about the idea of loss prevention. What the sole power of impeachment can do is to disqualify someone who has qualified immunity. So if there's a bad actor, they're outside of the emoluments of the office, they are under an oath of office that binds them to their job description and to the bills of rights, 
the House can impeach that bad actor and remove his qualified immunity. But the House has to have a reason to come into session and to do these things. All right? And if you just think about Nancy Pelosi as the worst example of, of why the House would come into uh, proceedings to decide if, if someone should be impeached and go through a trial. <clears throat> At least you have an example of, of how of of the 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 framework and how it works. So they have an oath of office. People who have an are are in a position of public trust. They have an oath of office. They have to do the their job duties as outlined in their in their contract in their agreement, and they also have to, as they relate to us, they have to uphold our bills of rights. They have to uphold all of our rights. It's kind of like when um, you know people think about this. Well, we gave we we had an election and we gave our sovereignty over to the representatives. But if you read the Ninth and Tenth Amendments in the Bills of Rights, it is kind of like um, a parent giving their kid the car keys, and they say, "Hey, look, okay, I'm going to loan you my car." but you can't speed in the car and you have to wash the car before you bring it back to me and you have to be in the house by 10 o'clock and you have to, uh, you know, you've, you've got to abide by these conditions. So I'm going to give you some leeway by loaning you my car, um, but you have to conform to these standards. And if the, if the, once you give me your car keys, you haven't given up the ownership of the car. You still own the car. And they have a condition for employing the use of that car. And the same thing is true with our actors. And what we do is we, take, we, we force them to take an oath of office. If they're, if they're in an office, they cannot be an officer until they've taken the oath of office. They've got to uphold their bills of rights. Otherwise, they violated the condition of their employment. So how this relates to OCS is obvious that the bills of rights are declaratory of our common law. They have to uphold our right to due process of law, all of us. Any government actor is under oath of office to uphold our right to due process of law. Unless we contracted, we, well, I probably, I probably shouldn't do this, but there, some hold that if there's a contract, you can contract away, you can give up your rights. Um, but these are God-given, unalienable rights that cannot be given up even if you try to give them away. So anyway, you can't contract these rights away. These are your rights. They're part of your DNA. They're your rights no matter what happens. So this is the whole purpose of redress and remonstrance in the First Amendment is that if we find that there are officers outside of their conducting business outside of the emoluments of their office, the, the job description that they were hired to do, they can be impeached in their, their immunity can be impeached. The House of Representatives can strip that immunity. Now, that's why we talk about this in terms of loss prevention. So you've got, <clears throat> you've got, um, Something called, um, and I sent this to everybody. Something called a differential response. And I sent the report to you. It's a pretty short read. But the differential response talks about um, an alternative to upholding the parental rights of people involved in child welfare cases. And if you read through this report, it appears that the purpose of the differential response, having them sign a safety plan, is to get around all of the protections that are in our bills of rights. Because the parents agree to this differential plan. <clears throat> So 
things happen and it moves forward and there's nobody upholding, there's nobody there upholding anybody's rights. So they basically, what their, their argument is that the families that OCS is working for that have signed safety plans, um, they've basically forfeited all of their, their due process, their bills of rights, their common law, and that the OCS worker no longer has to uphold those. They can just do whatever needs to be done to get the children into you know family law court. The other aspect of this um, to understand is that the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of a Child, and this is according to Homeschooler Legal Defense Foundation or Association, is that through the Universal Declaration on the Rights of Children, Sharia law was brought into our family law court. And what this means is that we've, in these particular courts, we've thrown away the entire model of due process. We've thrown away the entire common law. If people agree to go into this type of, type of process that they get from the from the differential response, you'll read about it in the differential response report, they're agreeing to go into a court that is a foreign, a court foreign to our common law sensibilities. Um, now, uh, maybe what I'll do is stop for a second, see if there's any kind of clarification that we need at all before I go on. Uh, hello, uh, this is April, and uh, thank Hi, you for doing this tonight. Hello, good evening, everyone. Um, I was just wondering, you know, you say that the parents agree. Um, how can they agree if they don't know? I mean, I'm, I'm, wait, I don't mean to jump that way, but I mean, uh, how do they agree? They just sign something, and well, that's because a, there's, that's, there's that, good that is a can. There, right? Yeah, you've opened a can, a good can of worms, and. Um, so they call it a they call it an agreement, but an agreement has to there has to be in in any agreement there has to be full disclosure and a meeting of minds and several other standards that constitute a real true agreement. And it cannot be done under threat, duress, coercion. You know, you can't it's not an agreement. It's not a contract. Deceit or fraud. Lawful. What's that? Yeah, nor deceit, nor fraud, and it has to be a quid pro quo for it to be, there's that word. There has to be due consideration. So there's there's no, you know, and, and in common law there's due consideration. In the legal society there's no consideration that has to change hands. So it just depends on where you're at. But most American citizens believe that they're just, they they understand their rights in a very basic way. They know what they can expect from somebody who is in a position of public trust. They expect that that person in that position can't lie to them, that that person wouldn't extort them. So it's very, very shocking to the conscience of, of people who really don't, can't really articulate this, but it's very shocking for them to know they're being extorted to sign this agreement with these welfare people. And what, what I mean by that is if they use, um, um, if they have a coercion in the agreement, either you sign this or you won't see your kids. We'll terminate your parental rights. If you don't deal with a safety plan on this one, we're going to get your other two kids. And we hear this over and over and over again. So first of all, they can't contract away their parental rights, their due process, their all of their rights. And if you look at the Ninth and Tenth Amendment, what are your rights? They're everything. Your rights are everything, all-encompassing. Um, it says the, enumer the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. You have the right to do anything and everything as long as you don't harm another. You have all everything. 
everything is your right, as long as you're not harming another. So, so the there's you can't and you can't contract these away. They're unalienable. They're God given. They were given to you. They can't be taken. You can't contract out of them. So the number one saying you can contract out of them. You can pretend you're not. <clears throat> well, you can contract out of them. You can just come under civil law, and and that means. Or Sharia, that means you're guilty until you prove that you're innocent. There, it's 180 degrees off of what we all believe is true. So they're saying, first, you can contract out of those rights. And second, they're saying we can extort the contract and still um, go to the family law court and enforce an extorted fraudulent contract. So you can, as you start to see how this breaks down, as opposed to an oath upheld. Now, so the question becomes really, really obvious. Okay, why isn't anybody doing anything about this? They're completely unlawful. They have been told. The ombudsman's report shows that the state has known. There are other, you know, there's other lots of, lots of, work that's been done in this state since 2010 at least and 20 years before that according to some of the people that we've talked to. The state knows that this is unlawful and it's being done. The people know that they're being screwed. <clears throat> um, they're using all of these, um, the, the AFSA, the American Safe Families, ASFA, American Safe Families Act, to bring incentives to children who are taken out of the home, put into foster care, adopted. Um, basically, there's the, the breakdown of, of the family is incentivized by federal dollars. We know that. We know that all of this is going on, but where's the missing piece? Where's the, uh, the remedy? And apparently Chris Hallett figured out the remedy. First of all, <clears throat> loss prevention. He, he set up E-Clause for loss prevention for the state. So what happens through this process of redress and remonstrance is that a family would take an affidavit into the legislature, a sworn statement of truth into the legislature and say, your bad actor, uh, Jane Doe, did this on this date, and I expect to be made whole because, you know, for whatever, whatever financial or, or tort claim they have, I expect to be made whole. That's redress. And remonstrance is you've got to train your actors never to, to do this act again, never to extort another one of these contracts again. People can go into them voluntarily, but remonstrance says you can't allow this to happen, state of Alaska, otherwise you're complicit. So you got redress where they're, they're made whole in any financial way where they can be made whole. And then remonstrance, which corrects, which corrects the wrong so that it doesn't continue happening over and over again. Why does the state, why should the state be excited that these things are coming from us? Why, how does it help them with loss prevention? <clears throat> Anybody know? Excuse me. Yeah, I, I'm just thinking that um, it, it, for me, I, and it's just my opinion, but it seems like the, the real problem has got to start, the solution has got to be in the home um, because, I mean, I know I'm standing here, you know, looking back and we've been taught to live in a defensive way when it comes to our our government and okay. hey, April, we can't I'm gonna, let I'm them gonna just come in and, and you April? know do that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, just hold yeah. off hold that. I wanna I'm I'm asking a question particularly how oh, okay. why are these petitions of redress and remonstrance good for the state in that they that they allow the state um to take care of this issue without a loss? How does this prevent well, a loss? A, 
it's the same reason that uh, Chris Hallett is hired as a defense contractor because the state is liable for the costs and damages that are being perpetrated. And as people start to file lawsuits, it'll sink the state. And okay, but this is meant to yeah. bring it back in line. Well, right. But what I'm saying is the state should want these right from the get-go. Why should they want them? And that is, it's, it's just that the state has written, the state knows that all of its actors are under the oath under oath of office. They also know that the public servants have a job description. And those people are bonded separately for law. So if you take your petition of redress into the state of Alaska, into the legislature, and you, you um, do the petition of redress and remonstrance, and you call into session a joint session of the legislature, because that's what the petition of remonstrance does. It calls into session um, the decision-making group. So that means a quorum has to, has to assemble. And the quorum can look at your petition to see if any of these Actors under its auspices have gone outside their job descriptions. And it can impeach their qualified immunity. The state then distances itself from that bad actor. Now it's not the state's fault. Because as soon as they knew they took action to correct the situation, and they said, you have to go after this bad actor under his bond, okay? So now the state's not liable, but the actor is. So it's loss prevention. That's why everybody wants this, except the bad actor. I mean, I think that's what we're seeing with Comey right now. I think they'll, they're, they're given a chance for the, the, um, everybody to distance themselves from this bad cop and all the bad cops. Go ahead. I was just going to say, is that kind of like taking away their immunities? They, yes, the, the, the House has the sole power of impeachment. That's why, we, that's why the, the petition for redress and remonstrance and or remonstrance goes into the chief. Chief Clerk of the House of Representatives. Now, I've heard someone say, we take these petitions to our fellow man, and our fellow man is in the House of Representatives because that's supposedly, you know, you elect these people to the House of Representatives to represent the people. So you're taking your petition of redress and remonstrance to your fellow man. They're listening to it. They have the power of impeaching that bad actor. And then there's a referral that goes to the attorney general. The reason we have an att a state attorney general is because his job is to prosecute bad actors. His job is to go after these people in positions of public trust when they go outside their job description. Now, why hasn't this happened? What, what happened? I mean, we thought Tammy had conducted all of these um, test um, the investigation, but never did one person put down their testimony in the form of an affidavit. The reason putting it in the form of an affidavit if you're a commercial person or a citizen or putting a declaration of truth down on paper and signing it under penalty of perjury or signing it with a common law uh, phrase that says you're going to verify it in open court and putting on a signature or an autograph, that thing, that piece of paper, stands as truth in commerce. An unrebutted affidavit stands as truth in commerce. Every one of these states of corporations are corporations. They operate in the commercial jurisdiction. Okay, this is my best understanding. And it makes sense. So if they do not rebut the affidavit, if nobody at OCS can come against that 
that declaration of truth and or the affidavit in the form of truth if they can't come at that thing and attack it with facts that, that are evident evidence you know actual facts and evidence rebut the affidavit and prove it's not true that is going to be an unrebutted affidavit and it's going to stand as truth in commerce. You take it into your commercial state of Alaska, that unrebutted affidavit is, is, the, is God's truth. Okay? So when they read that, they know that's an un, unrebutted affidavit. They have to take it as true. And they have a choice then. They can continue the fraud and continue... And, and engage in the cr criminality, or they can distance themselves from that bad actor, impeach that bad actor, refer him to the attorney general, have the attorney general prosecute that bad actor, and 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 drain the swamp. So that's how it works, and that's 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 redress. A um, couple other things, and we'll end the we'll end the you know, my diatribe and we'll go on to questions and answers. But I want to make sure this is all together in one one teaching um, before we go off on on uh, other questions. <clears throat> affidavit of truth, uh, basis of claim, unrebutted affidavit of truth. Okay, so how to write a declaration of truth. Very, very simple. Um, just, just study how to write an affidavit of truth. If you're a common law person, you'd write a declaration of truth. You'd autograph it. An affidavit of truth is coming under the 14th Amendment. Um, you're invoking due process in the 14th Amendment. Declaration of truth, you're just invoking the 9th Amendment. All other rights are reserved to the people. So you say your truth is a declaration. Um, a declaration of truth contains facts. The uh, the when so you'd put you'd write firstly on blank date and then a brief statement of fact that answers who, what, and where. So you want your de your affidavits or your declarations of truth just to very simply state what the facts are. Facts are things to which the writer has first-hand knowledge. So you can't write something down that's your opinion that someone else told you. It's things you, you have first-hand knowledge. You've been given documentation. You've been set, set, you know, sent a letter. Um, you were there face-to-face, -face, what have you. Um, you've seen the evidence yourself. Um, pertinent documentary proof is attached. So if you got a letter that said no, uh, we're writing from OCS. We will not give you your case file. Attach that documentary proof as an exhibit. So very, very simple to write an affidavit of truth or a declaration of truth. And I will, you know, if anybody needs one, I'll send a template on what that, <clears throat> what that looks like. But it's just, um, I, uh, I, a man, declare and then say, firstly, on the 1st of July, uh, 1976, um, and then give the pertinent facts, and on the 2nd of July, and then on the 3rd of July, I got a letter, and here's Exhibit A, here's the letter. So you just simply write down the facts. Um, for example, um, an example of this would be that somebody asked OCS for their case file, and OCS um, somebody at OCS, John Doe or Jane Doe, said that I wasn't going to be allowed to be given my case file as long as I had an attorney. So you write down, on this date, this person denied me my case file. And then maybe a second entry is, on this date, I called my attorney, I told them I wanted my case file, and my attorney denied me giving my, my case file, sent me back to OCS. The third date, I went back to OCS. I explained the situation. I've asked the attorney. He won't give it to me. You guys won't give it to me. Okay? Um, those are the three facts. So, and then just sign that affidavit. Sign it at the bottom. I say here and will, shall verify in open court that all herein be true. It's a verified 
affidavit and you put on your autograph. Okay, so that forms the basis of your claim for redress and remonstrance to the state. So if we got uh, 150 of these and everybody had the same complaint, they can't get their case file. They have a right to their case file. They can't get their case file. You know, there might be 150. There might be, a, you know, there might be 500 of those in the state that could happen very, very quickly. It doesn't matter if there's one. It's still a violation of that person's right. Um, but if there were, if there were 20 or 25, you know, the 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 um, and they were all attached to petitions of redress and remonstrance, and they all kind of went in at the same time then the legislature could very quickly do something about impeaching these, these actors that were engaged in this. Same thing if they were extorted to get into a safety plan. They could write this, these petitions of redress up and say, hey, they, they, this actor on this date coerced me. I didn't know I had an alternative. Um, I signed the safety plan and all hell broke loose and my family's gone from me now, okay? So then the state would be able to impeach that particular actor for coercing and extorting the safety plan, something like that. So it doesn't have to be a big complex 42-page uh, affidavit of truth. It could be something that's simple, that you know, is in a, a, you know has broken the law, that can go into the legislature, and they are going to have to act on it. I did call the chief clerk's office, um, talk to her, talk to one of the chief clerk's um, administrative people. And the first day that I called, within an hour, they got back to me. They don't do anything without talking to the legal department. They said the legal department affirmed this is your, this is a federal right and a constitutional right. You have the right to redress. And I said, tell me what the rules and the procedure for filing a petition of redress is in the, in the state legislature, the Alaska legislature. And she said, just send that in to us and then we'll figure out the process. So that's kind of where we're at, but we know that Congress shall make no rules respecting my right to assemble the government and to redress it. So we're going with that. And as far as what the process is, these happenings in all the other states um, are showing us and telling us that the states are really highly motivated in order to separate themselves from the liability of bad actors. Um, um, what, is, what does this look like? Um, they get a knock at the door, and then there's a couple of like sheriffs there, or with the uh, with the uh, you know the OCS or whoever the CPS uh, person, and they just uh, say we're going to take your kids. Is, uh, how does this? They they must kind of work it in real, they're real nice at first or something, or how does this, this, this uh, manipulation start? Yeah, well, it, it starts with people that are, are ignorant of the law, they're ignorant of almost everything that we shared on this tonight, the oath of office, the bills of rights, they're ignorant on almost all of that, and what it, what is so amazing and, and, and so horrible is the way that these things do start. One guy that we know in, in town said that it all started one day when he, he went uh, home and on the door of his apartment was a business card of an OCS worker and all it said, it had a little handwritten note, call me. And he's lost all of his life savings. He's divorced now, and his kids are all gone from him. He spent $50,000 on attorney, and he has nothing at all to show for it. His kids are gone from him. And that's offer and acceptance. The offer is the business card on the door. Accepting the offer is making the phone call. And then the next offer will be um, 
we know this and we know that and we have this and we're going to do that or whatever, and uh, you need to sign the safety plan. And acceptance of that offer is a signature on the safety plan. And so it goes, and they wade in. And then the next thing is, we need you to jump, jump through this hoop, and we need you to jump through that hoop. And that's an offer. And the acceptance of the offer is, people start jumping through the hoops. And they're, what they're doing is they're recognizing OCS as an authority, and they're giving it jurisdiction, and that means control. And I'm, I know that everybody that's worked through, with OCS knows the kind of control that they can get um, of people who think they're going to lose their, their own flesh and blood, their family. So, yeah, it's, it's just commerce. It's just business, April. It's all just to make money. And if that sounds like the mafia, <laughs> there's a reason. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It is. It is absolutely yeah. the mafia. It's, yeah. headed, you know, it's headed under all the other stuff that we've learned over the years. You know, who the Pope is and the Queen and all these different power outlets and, and the Bar Association. And <laughs> we're, we're getting a good picture of it. So, so then the, the thing would be for him not to just throw that card away, right? I mean, just to, I mean, we not yeah. give him permission. Right. I don't want to just answer your question. I want to answer it with an example. The one example that we have up here that I know of where the guy taught his kids never to speak to any of these people. If they come at school, he has forbidden them to be allowed to speak with his children at school. They have taught the kids their bills of rights and their constitutional rights. And these people stand on them, and finally, 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 they realized they should stop answering the telephone. Just stop answering the telephone. Stop talking to these people. Don't give them any, any kind of uh, recognition. They have nothing except for, you know, they've got, you know, they've got all of Sharia law and all of the civil world and all of the, you know. But you still have to give them your you still have to give them your consent. So stop consenting. I do not consent. That's the attitude, and I don't contract. You know, and it goes back to I know who I am. I know who you are, and I'm not getting involved with you. Mama always told me not to talk to strangers. Yep. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, and that's a fine response. Um, you know, I've started calling this pocket constitution. Here's your corporate charter. You know, you just hand them anybody you're working with. Here's your corporate charter. Um, and I accept your oath of office and hold, hold it open to the, uh, the bills of rights so that you know as soon as you're dealing with one of them so you know who you are and you know who they are. But then we got to take it to the next step. I really think what's been absent is it, it, it been absent from the people who created the government was redress. Was saying, okay, we're showing up when you guys aren't, they're not going to police themselves. And if the people are gone, the ones that hold them in check are gone. The, we hold the moral ground. And so we don't go in and from time to time redress and remonstrate and, and teach them and tell them what they have to do and give, make them pay when they don't do right and they commit crimes against us and our neighbors. If we never go in there, they don't have any motivation to police themselves. They're engaged in commerce. That's, that's how they got to be commercial entities in the first place. We could have stopped it by remonstrance. We didn't know. We, we were ignorant. Can you, can you talk about that a little more? Like, um, is there, can you give an example? 
a remonstrance, let's say. There's no, a real. Yeah. So, I mean, the way that you say we basically things have fallen apart because people aren't doing what they're supposed to do. All right. So if you have a with it. Mm-hmm. so remonstrance is is designed as a formal way of letting the legislature know when they've got a, a a harebrained idea like take away all the guns from all the people in Virginia or whatever it is. You got a harebrained idea, and we're stopping you. This is a petition of remonstrance to the legislature. You can't do that. You've got an oath of office, and you cannot violate the bills of rights. Read the Second Amendment. Okay? It's plain. You can't do that. That's a petition for remonstrance. It stops it in its tracks. We could have stopped the the um, land jurisdiction counties from incorporating back when, by 1965. But you know, it's water under the bridge, but we can we can still do it. And if we start cleaning up uh, welfare services when they do this and they try to de- deny families of their parental rights under United Nations treaties, bringing in Sharia law into our country just because people are so ignorant they don't know who created them and who, you know... W- they don't understand common law, where it came from, what it is, what it means to be an American, and why. Um, some people would say, well, that's, you know, that's the reason why they're all being deprived of their, their families. Because they forgot who they were, or they, they never knew who they were, really. But, but anyway, the point being... We see this. We see this happening to our neighbor. We can take standing under a beneficial public interest. We can go advocate for our neighbor who's having their kids taken away, help them write an affidavit, and get a petition in so that the legislature removes this bad actor's immunity. They can, they can remove their qualified immunity. But is that... I mean, are we connecting all the dots? Is, are there any missing pieces? I don't... Well, when you were saying that uh, they're, they're part of the corporate and they're, they're being rewarded, uh, those are the, the government workers, I'm assuming. Um, I mean, it, it just... Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I'm, still, I'm still listening. It's still coming to me that... Um, yeah, I, I'll just keep listening. I'm, I'm getting it slowly. Yeah, and, and I'm I'm just asking if there's if there's any big missing pieces that or if or if the dots are pretty well connected that you go from you go right from the oath of office to the bill of rights to a petition of redress to removing the qualified immunity of a of a bad actor and a referral for that bad actor to be held accountable. Now, this isn't, you know, I'm not saying did I did did I miss a piece when I came up with this process? This process is not it's it's all it is is due process of law. We're just discovering that this process exists by by becoming aware of what's in the Mason's manual by really reading it for understanding instead of just kind of skimming it over and and thinking the courts of justice. I don't know what those are. Courts of justice. We think we thought those were the courts, the same courts that we call the courts of law. Courts of Justice is the legislature coming into a joint session, into a quorum, to make sure its bad actors are held accountable for their bad actions. And it's, it's all outlined. You know, all of this is outlined in the Mason's Manual. These are, these are processes that are there. But until we know about the Mason's Manual, it may not be possible for us to read it and, and, and follow through. So that's why we, 
you know, we want to give credit to Chris Hallett, and uh, he's basically the one who 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 stumbled on this. And it, and he stumbled on it because his job in the private sector is loss prevention. All right, it's it's seven fifty nine. We've been on the phone about an hour, and I. You know, again, I want to keep these recordings really short. So we'll give you one last shot at it. And other than that, I think we're just going to call it a night. Um, go ahead. May I? Yes. This is Destry. I wanted to let, let you know about something that's going on in Michigan with a friend of mine. I'm helping <clears throat> this woman. Her name's Valerie Willis. She's going on ballot to be a senator from Michigan, and the state has attacked her. I introduced her to accepting the oath of office as a contract. See, uh -huh. Tonkin versus Erie Railroad, when that court case happened, our entire judicial system switched over from common law to contract law, which can be run through maritime, Sharia, whatever they choose. They that contract, that oath is a contract. They put it out there. But for a contract to be valid, it has to be between two parties. In order for us to be bound to it, to have our rights upheld through the Constitution, we have to be a party to that contract. And she is contracting through the prosecutor's oath, the judge's oath, the clerk's oath, all of them, even the sheriff, his oath. And now she's going after the Michigan Attorney General and his oath to accept it as a contract. And she has got them reeling. They're going nuts. They're extremely polite. Every time they communicate with her or she sees them face to face, they keep their heads down. She's getting back everything they've taken away from her. Her home they stole, she's getting it back. It's really incredible, and she is so ecstatic over this that she wants to put YouTube videos out on what's happening and how she's doing it. Yeah, that's um, yeah, and and she's accepted all of their oaths of office in writing or yes. verbally, or yes, she does it in writing, and she has it notarized and returned. Uh huh. And she is so ecstatic over this. And she's she's telling me some horror stories. She's a farmer. She's just a Michigan farmer. She had she owned an insurance company which they shut down. Now she's starting a bakery and they're not even bothering with it because she's accepting their oaths as contract. But it's it's really interesting to see this play out and what's happening. It all revolves around her accepting their oaths as a contract, because the only way it's valid is between two parties. Well, it should be valid. Don't you think, I mean, we've all, always thought it should be valid because they, you know, they've all always taken this oath of office to uphold their, the bills yes. of rights for the people. And what you're saying was exactly correct until that Tompkins versus Area Railroad case. When that happened, everything changed. For a valid contract, must be between two parties. Each case is an individual case. There's two parties. That makes Absolutely. a lot of sense. Yeah, I really yeah. appreciate filling in that that piece of the puzzle. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I've been li I've been listening to this call since seven o'clock, and I kept thinking that, and figured I better inject it before the call's over. Excellent. Yep. I think that's great. That makes that makes a lot of sense, and people ought to go and read, find that decision, and and get a full understanding as to the reasons why. Now, under the Ninth Amendment, and you know, I don't, I don't really give jurisdiction to the Supreme Court of the United States. We know that we have our rights because of, you know, God gave them to us unalienable, and but. For these government actors, they are indoctrinated into that way of thinking, and they do have to follow what the Supreme Court of the United States says. So, 
it's that's why it's it's so effective. Because now you have an agreement, a contract, like you sh like you're saying, you're party to that contract now. What is it your governors can do? How is it that we have come to thinking and believing that anyone has more to say than you? Stand up, sing your song Let us know the wisdom of your heart That you belong, that we belong to you That you belong to us and that our love is all and true First step and commit to take a chance. Believe, just relax. Cause no one ever died of trying to take the music back. Just leave it to them others to excuse. Well, state your heart, be yourself. Help us understand it's you and everybody else I'll take a breath and I'll see it through You know that I am more myself when I'm standing up for you that we don't see the pain which we exchange for circumstance made easy to believe in where everybody's loss becomes a gain come forth reach out your hand be your brother's keeper this one time Say he belongs Say we belong to him That he belongs to us And that our love is all and true 